Two friends, two pastors, two theologians, pursuing spiritual life by exploring the scriptures in conversation with the fathers. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterion. Uh, Well, hello. Welcome back to Mysterion Theology Podcast. We have not gone away forever. We're back with an interview we're really excited about. And then we will launch out in the season of Lent as well with a new season. Uh, we have with us, we're honored to have with us, Father Seraphim of Mall Monastery in the Celtic Islands. Uh, Wes and I love uh, listening to his spiritual advice through his podcasts and through YouTube videos. And we have wanted for a while to bring him on and ask him some questions about spiritual life and the life of the Desert Fathers and the Celtic Saints. And we're going to get into all of that today. Um, uh, Father Seraphim is the founder of Mall Monastery, but I will ask him to just tell us a little bit about himself and Mall Monastery so people can know where you're coming from. Please. <clears throat> well, before we jump into that, I need to thank uh, Wes and Ethan, the two of you, very, very much for this invitation. And I'm sorry it's taken me a bit longer than I would have liked <clears throat> to to agree. It's just that, you know, Christmas time and Pascha time are usually very, very busy. So it, it was entirely my, my fault on that end. Well, who are we? Uh, we are definitely not who I thought we would be 10 years ago when I said yes to this monastery. Because 10 years ago, I said yes to an abandoned church with a small vestry room about two meters by three meters uh, attached to it. And I imagined I'm going to live there entirely by myself. I would live in the vestry room and then I would have the chapel for my prayer and for whenever an occasional pilgrim would come. Uh, I imagine I would support myself just by asking my friends from Moldavia to support me and making prayer ropes and <laughs> things like that. And um, and that's definitely not what God blessed. Uh, things went incredibly wrong from my point of view, but uh, <clears throat> incredibly right <laughs> from God's perspective. And today there is a, there is a community here. There are six, six of us, uh, three brothers living in a, a community very close to that old church I mentioned to you, and three sisters living very close to the Isle of Iona. Uh, both communities on the Isle of Mull. We have about two hours driving between us, but we act and we function as one community. And I am the priest and the spiritual father of the community. And um, that's that's pretty much who we are. But yeah, we, we appeared out of nowhere, so to say, 10 years ago, intending to live a very simple life as a hermit on this remote island of Scotland. And then God had other plans and I just had to, it's always safer to say yes to God. He, he's not someone to mess with, from my experience. I think one of the things that you share um, when you talk about Mole Monastery um, is that this is the first um, monastery um, on the, in the Orthodox tradition for, for a thousand years, right? Um, and in the Hebrides, in, in, in the Hebridean islands, that's true. Uh, there is, um, there is, an orthodox presence in scotland there is for instance a wonderful mother who lives in the orkneys uh, orkneys and the shetlands are to the very north of scotland and she's been there for many years <clears throat> before the monastery was established and uh, there are some wonderful fathers again in edinburgh who are monastics but they don't function as a monastery they function forgive me, as a, a parish for the Greek jurisdiction. So there is, in Scotland itself, there is monastic presence, but in terms of a monastery in, in the Isles, in, in the Western Isles, where most of the saints have lived, everyone from St. Oron and St. Columba, it's the place where St. Ninian came in late 300s, early 400s to, to bring Christianity to the tribes here. In the Western Isles, this is the first Orthodox monastery, yeah, since the destruction of uh, monasticism here, both the Orthodox monasticism, forgive me, forgive me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it, it's okay. But, but, I, I think that, I think that mm-hmm. you see uh, the deep connection between the, the Celtic saints, um, you know, St. Brendan and St. Aidan and St. Cuthbert, and mm-hmm. uh, the monastic tradition of the, the early church and fathers and the desert um, spirituality there. And, you know, that's something that um, Mysterion has been, we, 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 we speak 
about that and try to think theologically and spiritually from that tradition, how do you see the connection between the Celtic saints and uh, the, the early fathers there? Again, I mean, I don't want to, um, I actually, I want to make absolutely certain that I'm not projecting an image where I'm someone who's been, uh, who's seen a vision that I have to come here and reestablish Orthodox monasticism, or I, I don't have any grand vision of the future of myself or this monastery. I, honestly, all I wanted was to have a peaceful corner of the world where I, where I could live by myself and live my monastic life. But then need has made me do a ton of other things I had never anticipated because God has clearly blessed that this should be a monastery. And slowly, as I've done those things, I've, I've begun to discover all the saints who, who lived in these aisles. And uh, we've begun to work on uh, recreating, rewriting the icons, for instance, and uh, rewriting their lives, digging them out and bringing them you know, back into the present and showing people how they are frightening in their beauty and they're frightening in how relevant they can be to our very urgent issues today. Anything from spiritual uh, struggles to sexual abuse to bullying to environmental problems, they are actually, they share a, a rawness, a sense of, of a raw interaction with the world, which I fear that um, has been somehow uh, varnished away in the lives of most of the other saints uh, from the Orthodox tradition. Because, because there is a reason there, because of course they were as raw as they were when they were alive, and then their tradition disappeared, and it, it was just buried by a millennium of silence. And now when you dig them out, you find them as raw and uh, abrupt, if you want, as they were at the end of the first millennium. Whereas what has happened with the other traditions and the lives of the other saints from the first millennium is that you have another millennium, the second one, of their lives being rewritten, reinterpreted, being given new significance that maybe they didn't have initially and so on. So we've, we've, poli we've polished the lives and, uh, of those saints to a degree that has not happened here. And that makes these saints extremely uh, striking, uh, violent almost in, in, in how otherworldly they, they can be. Well, thank you for that. Um, can I ask you if we could push uh, a little further with that? Is, is there something, because I, I, I've often heard you speak really wonderfully out of the traditions of the Desert Fathers, the very practical advice they give. And then when you tell the story of some of the Celtic saints, is there, is there something that strikes you that's like uh, about that connection? Because it seems to me the Desert Fathers also, at least in the, the advice that's been mm -hmm. given, be very raw. It's, it's, it's a hard word sometimes and you get into it and you find a deep compassion on the inside. Is there something like that you find in common? Um, or, or is it just what you said before? Out of all the different traditions of the first millennium, uh, by far, the, the Celtic saints, as, as I've encountered them, not only by reading uh, about them, but my, my own personal interaction with them in my prayer and uh, in the realities of my life, of our daily life. I mean, we are here because of them. We pray to them in the morning, we pray to them in the evening, we spend our days with them. It's been 10 years now of doing that. By far, they are alike, the saints of the Egyptian desert. And there is, I mean, there are historical reasons for that, very clear and very well documented. The um, lists of the Irish saints begin with the unknown, um, Egyptian fathers. The, I think there are the seven Egyptian fathers. They are listed as the first saints of Ireland, but they don't have any names, but they're there. And uh, there is a very clear, a very clear connection in terms of the um, art, the iconography of uh, Ireland and the Scottish Isles, as you see them in the illuminated manuscripts that have been preserved. For instance, the Book of Kells, which was created 10 minutes away from us uh, on the island of Iona, or in the sculptures that you see on the huge Celtic crosses of Ireland and again of Scotland, the, the art, the iconography 
of this region is clearly influenced by the iconography of, of Egypt. Uh, <clears throat> the inexplicable presence of uh, figures such as uh, St. Anthony the Great and St. Paul uh, from the Egyptian desert, they are always represented in these books, in the funeral uh, tombstones, on these huge, tall stone Celtic crosses. Um, the even even the beehives, to a degree, even the beehives have have an influence from the Egyptian tradition. Because if you go into the old cells, the cells in which the desert fathers uh, have lived, they look just like these. They are basically igloos made of stone that was supposed to be very low so that the storms of um, of the desert do not crush them down and they were supposed to be round so that all that you know dust passes them by but what's what's more significant to me than anything uh, is the spirituality and and the very clear similarities between the spirituality of Egypt and of the isles it seems like when when we we come across literature today, often, you know, Celtic spirituality literature, um, there's a very sort of romantic imagery surrounding the Celtic music, mm -hmm. Celtic spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, but what we see, I think, when, when you talk about the Celtic saints and the Celtic early Celtic spiritual tradition, um, there, like you said, there's this rawness to it. There's this, um, mm -hmm. how do I say it? Like, it is almost the opposite of what we encounter in popular literature in terms of, um, you know, there's this kind of radical desire for God and the difficulties, the striking difficulties that they're living out. I mean, the desert, of course, is a, is a, is a uh, place where to, to live there is extremely difficult. And when you're talking about Scotland and, and, and Ireland, I mean, these places as well, it's, um, it's extremely difficult. And it just seems to me like when you talk about the spiritual tradition of the early Celtic saints, there is that deep connection, even with that asceticism, that, that striving after God that is in kind of marked contrast to what we tend to be exposed to in terms of Celtic literature. Um, I, I, am I right in that? I mean, would you would you agree with that or not? You are perfectly, you're perfectly right, Wes, absolutely perfectly right. Um, I'll give you just one example. So after the end of the first millennium, once the Celts had already become extinct, let's put it that way, the Celtic monastics, because of the um, of the Viking invasions towards the 900s, they had already either been butchered or ran away from the Scottish Isles and took refuge in Ireland or Northumbria, the north uh, east of England. After the end of that tradition, about three centuries later, so we are talking 1300s, 1400s, groups of Benedictine uh, monastics came and re-established monasteries where the old Celtic monasteries had been. And on Iona, there is, um, you can visit now, the ruins of um, a Benedictine nunnery, so a monastery for nuns established, I don't remember if it was the 1300s or the 1400s. And as you go into these ruins, <clears throat> you reach a point, which is a small room of, again, maybe maybe one meter and a half by three meters in, in the sense of how, how big it is, which is called the worming room. The only room in that monastery where they had a fire. Uh, this is a time before, uh, you know, double glazed windows and uh, proper doors and insulation. And uh, in that entire monastery, in that entire convent, there was one room where when they couldn't take the cold, the, 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 the wetness and the humidity of the storms and of the wind, they could go and heat themselves up. And these are, pay attention, these are women in the 14th century. Can you imagine the sort of spirituality of men who established that monastery in the 500s? Mm -hmm. And then try to compare that spirituality and the beliefs and the spiritual strength and, uh, and rigor of those men with what happens in the streets on the feast day of St. Patrick, for instance. I mean, I think in, in I think we've removed the reality of the Celtic saints uh, 
from our imagination of who they were to the extent to which we've we look at uh, you know a man dressed as Santa Claus ringing a bell in front of a supermarket and thinking that he, there is something of Saint Nicholas the wonderful wonder worker and and fighter for the orthodox belief present in that man with a beard and ringing a bell you tell the story you've told the story in the past of Saint Cuthbert going out to pray at night and going into the waves and praying all night in the ocean. And that story has really captured me. And just the thought of him, I mean, it's raging ice cold waves and he's- And, and, and the more I read about it, forgive me for, for interrupting, but I know I'll forget this, but it's something that struck me in the last two years, I think two or three years when I, I realized this, this was happening that when he was caught, so to say, when he was seen by the others in the monastery doing this, it did not happen as I had imagined in my mind towards the end of his life when he was already a hermit in his late life. This actually happened in the monastery where he entered as a novice. This was the foundation, the entry test of this saint. So profound and challenging. I, yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, when, you, when you draw from the Celtic saints this way, um, one of the things we would like to talk to you a little bit about is the desire for God. How do you see their desire for God expressed in these kinds of dramatic accounts, these stories that are being told? Um, how does that connect with their, their desire to, to know God and to share life with him? I don't know. In, in in some ways, when I when I when I talk about these things, and particularly if I if I take the approach that the Celtic saints are are giving me, which by the way perfectly mirrors what I have seen with my own eyes in my own life, in the monasteries in Moldavia or in you know the north of Russia, for instance, when I went to Solovki or on the Holy Mountain. The, the, I mean, yes, there are differences because we live a millennium and a half later, but the aim of it all, what the purpose for which these people, men and women, do what they do and they try to leave the world behind and to live a, a monastic life, that ideal is the same. Because what fuels them is the same desire to be with God. I think, I think um, we, again, have tamed our expectations of ourselves. I think we've lowered the expectations concerning ourselves. And that's because the greatest, the greatest mistake I can see is that we are very tempted to reduce Christ to a figure on the same level as, uh, I don't know, Buddha or any other you know, guru of the world. And uh, then, therefore, his teaching is just a set of teachings. The way somebody writes, you know, the 100 quick ways to be happy the, the 10 steps to peacefulness or mindfulness or whatever, whereas Christ did not come to make us peaceful, did not come to make us calm, Christ came to open for us a way to be saved. And I think we've, we've diluted that enormously, and we are now struggling to recapture something of, again, the rawness, the, the realness the, 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 of the living God and what that means about us. Because, you see, we, the, the lower, the lower we, we force God in our understanding, the more we dilute him, the more we dilute ourselves and our own expectations of ourselves because ultimately we are created in his image and the whole purpose of our existence is to actualize that image in us to reach the likeness of that image so if god is someone absolutely unreachable wonderful and frightening in, in, in his glory and in his his mystery to us then i who am created in his image and am called by him to reach a likeness of his image. I also am something unthinkably deep and mysterious and, and, and glorious to, to a degree that is hidden to myself today in this body, fallen body of mine, but a degree which I hold dear to myself as my ideal, my calling, my reason for existing, for existence. 
And when we talk about the desire for God, we actually also talk implicitly about the desire that one has to become who one really is. Is there's, it's, it's something that fills me with utter despair, the, the thought that there can be a single human being who is going through this life never experiencing himself or herself, never having at least an intuition of how beautiful God has created us. And the problem is that everything around us makes us feel so small and unimportant and hopeless in a degree because we are, who are we in the eyes of this society? We are consumers, not much more than that. We are consumers and we are defined by things such as our wealth or our status or our photographs on Facebook or Instagram or, or our sexuality. I mean, all these things that are only temporary things that, yes, are part of who you are, but do not define you, they become the criteria that defines who we are. Instead of this amazing, frightening, unthinkably wonderful God, which means that I also am equally wonderful and amazing. Forgive me, I've... I've, I've, I've uh, <sighs> When I talk about this thing, I kind of lose lose the sense of where I started or where I'm going because because this is the point of my life. This is why I'm in a monastery. This is why I entered a monastery, why I made a decision, and I wasn't even 19 when I decided to become monastic. And this is the desire for God that I also see in these saints. But it's very important, and I promise I'll make it short, I won't drag on and on. It's very important to understand that this desire for God also hides a desire, a craving, a longing for oneself. You, you crave for God. You believe in God because you crave for, for you and you believe in yourself. When you've abandoned yourself, there is no God anymore. Well, thank you, Father. That's uh, that's great. And I want to go maybe a little off script and, and, and rip off that a little bit because, um, you know, you, you started talking about some of the hardships that monastics, both nuns and monks, voluntarily endure in order to seek God, to develop the desire for God. And uh, I'm struck by how much, um, well, let me just say this. For many of us who are not monastics, it seems to us there's seems to me there's plenty of opportunity for this to do this. Like life itself is always sending uh, difficulties our way. And is there wisdom in this for how we approach these things? Because I think often I was taught coming up, you just pray for those things to go away. But maybe that there's a clue. Is there a clue to the fact that sometimes we have a very dead desire for God in that we don't know how to harness the difficulties that might um, reveal to us those depths, and, and then and then what would it be to embrace those things? I was a bit lost there because as I was saying what I was saying before, I realized that this this parallel between <clears throat> a desire for God, which actually is expressed, must be expressed in a desire for oneself is what ultimately fuels this entire ascetical tradition. You cannot do anything about God, but you can do something about yourself. I cannot get, you know, God by his beard and drag him into my life, but I can pull myself by my beard and, you know, pull myself up towards God. Um, it's a bit of an exercise of imagination for me to to advise you on what you as people living in the world could be doing. But, um, but I know people in the world who are absolutely wonderful and who are at a level of sanctity above many, if not most of the monastics I know. And many of these people are not even practicing Christians. They are Christians, and they, they will go to church from time to time. Uh, they, they receive the sacraments from time to time. They keep their fast from time to time. But they've managed to love others 
to the degree that they forget about themselves. And that is something I personally am not yet able to do. And not many of the monastics I know is able to do. But I don't want to put down monastics, neither are the very large majority of people living in the world. This is something that's very rare and it is a gift, but I have seen it in the world, let's say as frequently as I have seen it outside the world in monasteries. And uh, what, what you are saying, yes, of course, if you look at everything that happens to you as proof that the devil is tempting you or that the world hates you or why, oh God, why is this happening to me all the time? Then, of course, you are just going to fuel those negative uh, feelings in yourself. And uh, the fathers talk about these, these empty, vain struggles as if we are flies that have been captured in this great spider web. And we try to release ourselves by trying to get out when, in fact, all we do is we entangle ourselves even more and we, sig we signal the... A bad evil spider that you know that their lunch has arrived whereas they say that the way out of it is to be completely calm into it and to entrust yourself fully to god the problem for me is that this entrusting oneself fully to god becomes very much a, an intellectual mental exercise in our contemporary world today it's got nothing there's like there's nothing practical that one can do when in fact this is what you can learn from the Celtic saints and the deserts of the, uh, the desert fathers and all the saints actually of the church they always had something practical to do when they were in the middle of the of a city like saint basil the great who ended up feeding thousands of people and basically doing what a government should have done uh, to people like St. Anthony the Great or St. Cisoas the Great who lived completely alone for 70, 80 years in the desert. They always found things that they could do. I think, forgive me, I, I've spoken a bit too much. I think it's really a question of love and how you manifest that love, not only in the sense of going out to do something for other people, that's extremely blessed and we should do that, but also in the way in which you perceive yourself as the source, the spring, if you want, the seed of the blessing of the world and also the damnation of the world. Again, if you value yourself at your own true worth, you will see that in yourself, humanity itself and everyone else stands or falls. Let me ask you just about the desire for God um, in relationship to not only you know my spiritual struggles, but people that I've know that I know that I've had conversations with. I think one of the most uh, profound uh, common experiences that we have is the recognition that we have such little desire for God, um, that our desire for God is so small and so weak. And, you know, when you read the monastics and you read the fathers, you know, you get this, this sense of, you know, overwhelming desire, um, you know, and, you know, to go into prayer, for example, um, and want to truly, let's say, repent, um, but find ourselves um, so cold, so rigid in our hearts, so lacking a desire. Um, what, what do we do with that? Well, it, you go back to what I tried to tell you five minutes ago, and um, I got myself trapped in my own words and didn't make myself clear. <laughs> the difference between the fathers and us is not that they desired God more than we do, the difference between them and us is that they actually did something about it. We all know what we need to do. The difference is that only the fathers were doing it. Um, you know, in each generation, everybody who has the slightest serious intention to, to live a Christian life will realize, oh, you know, this requires a bit more of myself than just to be in church for two hours at the end of, uh, of the week and to donate, I don't know, $100 a month to my church. There's a bit more there given that what we ask of God is eternal life. We are not asking God for a car 
We are not asking God for health. We are not asking God for a good job. We are asking God that once we die and we are buried and our bodies are decomposed and we turn back into dust, centuries or millennia later, on Judgment Day, that dust is reassembled into a being that is so beautiful that actually it perfectly reflects God himself. That's what we are asking God. This is what salvation is. It's something as practical as go into a cemetery nearby and look at those graves and tell yourselves what I'm supposed to achieve, in quotation marks, because obviously it is the gift of God, but what I'm supposed to fight for is that these people who have been buried there for decades or centuries are going to be raised up of those graves and given a life again. This is mad. And yet we want to achieve this mad gift by doing something that's not even as challenging as passing an exam to be accepted in a university or a job interview. The difference between us and the saints is that they took God seriously. They took themselves seriously. They understood the worth that they had. They understood the battle, the spiritual battle that happens around us in order for us to be either saved or lost, and they acted. That's why I believe it is extremely important that we resurrect in our current understanding our worth, an understanding of our worth. We, have, we see ourselves as being very cheap beings. We, we teach ourselves that we are disposable. Everything from, from movies where you know, shooting 100 people in a scene means nothing to games that our children are seeing, to the way we relate to each other. I mean, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of negative feedback when I spoke about wearing masks and things like that. And I was told, yes, but what about you know, the loss in the economy and all the struggle of those families? What that tells me as a monastic is simply that we value the comfort of a family more than the life of our neighbor. We have a very low, cheap, fallen understanding of ourselves. And because of that, we do not find in ourselves the engine, the energy, the madness to fight for ourselves. If something, if you go out to buy an ice cream, and you have to make the money to buy the ice cream. You are going to work, I don't know, for half an hour selling pretzels in a corner. You'll make the money in half an hour. You'll go and you'll buy an ice cream. But if what you want to do is buy, I don't know, Buckingham Palace in London, you are going to work so much harder. that I mean, that's going to completely take over our life to make that happen. If salvation for you means to have a good life in a beautiful house with a good car and a peaceful spouse and then to just die as a good citizen, yeah, all you have to do is basically follow, follow the world and life itself will take care of all those things. But if you understand your worth and the battle against your salvation, then you are going to be consumed by this desire for God for yourself, and you're going to end up doing the things that feed that desire. That desire, it's a, cir it's a circle. I promise I'm going to shut up in a second. It is a circle. It, it's, you start with a desire which is here. Nobody starts any higher. We all start at the same level. There's an instinct. But some of us, then we act upon it. And the more you act upon it, the more, the more attuned you are to the voice of God in you, the more attuned your, your spiritual cords are to that voice. And the more you resonate, the more attuned you are, the greater your response is. And the more you respond, the greater your desire is. The more you get, the more you want. And the more you want, the more you are given. Christ does say that, you know, to the one who has a little bit, I'm going to give a lot more. You have responded, you have been faithful in, in the little that I gave you. And because you've been faithful in that little that I gave you, I'm going to give you so much more. But if in the little that I gave you, 
you have not been faithful and you have just let it waste away. Why give more so we can waste even more? Thank you. Um, I mean, I think you anticipated a lot of where I was going to go with some questions here. Um, so don't even answer this if you feel like you've addressed this completely. But um, I feel like in my experience, oftentimes there's been so um, sometimes there's a fit of enthusiasm about I'm going to fight for this thing. And then that dies down. And um, I see sometimes in the lives of those saints, those fathers, those mothers who were so alive to the beauty of salvation and how grand it is. And so they, they had a kind of quiet resolve that I think for a lot of people, they find that somewhat elusive. Uh, are there any pointers that you can think of in the tradition or you have to offer to help people do that stepwise movement up to, to fuel that taste, that desire to keep the beauty of salvation before them so that they, they, they have more of a resolve rather than an emotional enthusiasm that burns out in a few months. Just like, I mean, not unlike when you decide to do a workout program and a couple months later, it's just no longer fun. Are there some keys to having a resolve um, rather than just a kind of an enthusiastic quick burn? I think, I mean, I, I really don't know. I, I, I'm not, I don't have answers. That, that's a reality. I mean, Ethan, I do not have answers. I can only tell you what I've learned from my own monastery, from my own elder, my spiritual father, and what happened to me being the idiot that I am. I've made all possible mistakes, and I hope I've learned a bit from them. There are two things that come to mind now. One, it is essential that one belongs to a tradition. I, I have no idea uh, who is going to see this video, but it is vital that you belong to a tradition that incorporates an ascetical tradition. Because for 99% of our lives, as was the case for 99% of the lives of the saints as well, you are not going to float in uh, you know, clouds of light. You're not going to converse with angels and, and the saints. You're not going to float in your prayer. 99% of your life, you are going to feel dead and dry and stuck in the desert. There's a reason why Israel crossing the desert is the traditional image of one's spiritual life. From Egypt to the promised land, this is the entirety of our lives. And God has spoken a few times with Israel and always through someone, mediating through someone. It is vital that you have a tradition because when you don't know what to do, tradition itself tells you what to do. I mean, I know that sounds uh, basic, but it, it is it is basic in the sense that without this, I personally do not, I cannot imagine growth, spiritual growth. When you do not know what to do because nothing in you moves, because you are completely dead inside, at least you have this, um, I once thought about it as a scaffolding around you. When your own inner building has collapsed, at least you have the walls around you, like, like, like crutches, I think is the word, to keep you hanging. You do the things that you know you have to do. And from time to time, there will be bursts of the Holy Spirit that, that completely, completely illuminate everything in your life. But those are just confirmations that you are on the right path and just four tastes, four images of the kingdom of God. This is not, uh, this is not the entirety of, of anyone's life. I mean, if you think of the lives of any saint, they, they can be reduced into what? A novel. If, at the most, if, they, if they've lived in the last 200 years or 300 years, and we have more information about them. But the actual moments that, that have led to the glorification, canonization, are just a handful of them. The rest is just painstaking dedication and almost dead stubbornness. You keep on going because you realize that there is no alternative the alternative to moving forward in this is to collapse into nothingness. Once that is settled in you, 
then there's just no going back. There is no going back. I mean, people ask me, how, how can you stay in a monastery? I mean, what's there? I mean, it must be something beautiful that you want to. There's nothing beautiful about it. There's nothing. I didn't want to be. I mean, that's not true. I wanted to be a monk in the sense that I wanted to give myself entirely to God. There's no question about that. But I, I love arts. I love poetry. I love music. I love, and I don't, you know, I, I love a lot of things that are not necessarily bad, but that do not feed this craving for life in me. And I've had to understand that if I ever turn around, if I ever abandon moving forward, even when I feel dead, I am going to collapse into nothingness. That image of turning back and turning into salt is not a metaphor. It's as real and painful as it gets. And the other thing that came to mind when you said that was that, what can you do? Well, from time to time, it helps if you do something absolutely um, mad. I mean, purposely mad. It's something that just um, eats at the foundation of who you think you are. If you notice, for instance, that you end up seeing yourself, defining yourself through your wealth, then do something absolutely against your heart and, 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 and donate something extravagant to, to something that you personally do not care very much for. I mean, for instance, uh, in my heart, I, I, I love old people. I've always loved people, old people. Since I was a teenager, I, I, was, I was just in love with them. I don't know why, I still am. So if I had uh, a billion dollars, I would give that money to, I don't know, orphanages, not old people. Because I don't want to feed my own desire to affirm myself and also do it in a way that no one around you knows that you have done it. Do it somewhere which is removed from you and in a way that they don't know who you are. So in other way, cut any ways in which you are going to feel gratified by doing that. If you feel, uh, I mean, let me give you a very, a, a very real example. There was this father in uh, in my monastery in Moldavia, who was extremely, he still is, an extremely good singer, an extremely good singer. And uh, he struggled with, with, with that because of, of pride. And, um, and I know this because he confided this in me, not in confession and not as something that, you know, I should never share, besides nobody knows him. Uh, he, in order to fight this, at the height of the service, in the, in the most visible place of the service, when the bishop was present and everyone else was present, he took the wrong notes purposely. And he sounded like a donkey instead of the, the glorious, glorious singer. We all knew that he was. He purposely, purposely destroyed that idol that he had created of himself. If you are in love with your, with your sleep, for instance, if you feel, oh, without my sleep, I'm going to lose myself. This is not going to be, I'm not going to be able to function without sleep. Then fight with sleep. If, it's, if you are afraid that, oh, if I'm going to fast a bit more, I'm going to fall ill, entrust yourself to God. And of course, with the blessing of your spiritual father, fast for a day or for a week. Fast by eating once a week or once a day. Or I don't know, if you eat 10 times a day today, you know, eating just five times a day is going to be fasting for you. That's why you can never come with recipes because you do not know what that person is used to. But basically, you need to belong to a tradition that can take over when you can no longer do anything for yourself. And then you need to purposely and in full awareness just just chip away at the foundation of the pedestals of the idols that you build of yourself. Thank you. Give me just a second. Uh, I, I, the light is in my eyes and this is going to give me a horrible migraine. I'm just going to move. Is that okay? Of course. Yes, please. Yes. Just a second. Okay. This is going to look different, but that's okay. <laughs> I think some of the words that you were just sharing there were so um, challenging to me in some ways because, you know, just take the example of uh, the story of St. Cuthbert praying in the waves, you know, again, that can be a story of 
spiritual heroism and uh, um, we can get this sort of romantic vision about what that would look like and then think about, well, you know, I would like to do that or, or whatever it may be. But when you're, when you speak, when you're speaking about it, you're, you're talking about it in such a way that it just sort of strips away all of the, um, the ways in which even those acts can be channels for pride, spiritual pride. Um, yes, but you know why was because we don't try them. It's very easy for me to, to understand that this has nothing to do with pride because I've tried to do these things and I've failed miserably every time I've tried. And when you do that, all, all romanticism about it all you know, disappears. There's nothing romantic. Just get yourself awake. It, again, it's an exercise. Get yourself awake for a week, at, I don't know, two or three in the morning and keep yourself awake for one hour. Just, just, just try to do that and try to be outside for five minutes uh, in, I don't know, at midnight for, for a week uh, in the winter. And then you'll see, I mean, the story of Saint Seraphim of Sarov praying for 1,000 nights on a rock in the forests of Russia. I mean, I've been to Russia as a student. I studied there when I was 19, 20, and 21. I remember going out from the institute where we were studying, going out to buy food. And when I would go inside, coming from the outside, I had blood just bursting from my nostrils because my blood vessels in my nose froze. And when you come inside and you go back into you know, warmth, they explode. I mean, th there's the reality of these things will hit you when you try them. And the reality of these things, the, the, the attempts of practice, not even the practice, because most of us are not going to be able to do them, but just attempting to put them into practice will cure all these fake images of romanticism or pride. How can you be proud if you've tried it once, twice, ten times, and every time you run away scared like a chihuahua, having tried to do something that a lion has done? I mean, it, it's painful for me now. It's no longer proudful to talk about these things because having failed at them, every time I talk about them, I'm reminded of how fallen I am. And so these things which are now just imagining them fuels one's pride because you imagine yourself doing them. Once you try to do them, they end up fueling your humility. Just trying is immensely helpful, not even succeeding. Thank you. That, that's a word. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Father. I want to say a few words because the um, Mysterion audience is a mixed audience of Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant, mostly here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that, correct me if I'm wrong, and by all means, correct me if I'm saying something wrong or spiritually dangerous for people. Um, because it can almost feel paradoxical that most of us live with too small of a vision of what we're, you know, we're seeking to be resurrected into beings that perfectly image God who's unspeakably glorious. But we live in this sort of shrunken desire of comfort or entertainment or so forth. But then paradoxically, we, with that shrunken vision, we seek an easy comfort. Whereas it seems to me, like you're saying, the, the, the ascetical vision of the tradition is this grand desire of what we're seeking to be or, or to reach out to God to turn us into but recognition that that path is not easy. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's odd, right? Because the world seems to hold out something to us that's too small and says it's too easy to get, and then you never actually get it. And then you're describing a life through the life of the saints where there is this just, I mean, you're right, it's madness. What we call salvation is absolutely crazy. It's, it's unthinkably crazy. Yeah. But you're, but this call to do things because humility is the way to do things because as you said, 99% of the time, it's just, it's struggle, but it's struggle because it's grand. Um, so I just, I wanted to kind of lay that out that we live by too small of a vision of what it is to be human, truly human. Um, 
and then we, we search, we struggle for these little things thinking it'll be easy. And even if we get it, it's just like that. But then you say, you know, these, these holy, holy people, these holy women and men who have lived according to just, I mean, they've truly lived according to the madness of what we confess at church. Um, but they recognize. Do that is a perfect, there is a perfect correspondence between the madness of the salvation they were promised and their dedication and the ways in which they threw themselves in this quest for this salvation. But I don't want to say that either you two or myself or anyone who is going to listen to this have to necessarily go out and, you know, go into the ocean or the river or pray through the night for 1,000 nights. If God gave you the grace, glory be to God, and by your prayers, I hope to be saved as well. But I think it's safer to recognize our, our weakness. But even so, there are things that you can do. And there is so... There is such joy and a sense of intimacy with God when you begin to be to be creative with with your asceticism. Little things, very little things, like I don't know, deciding that you are going to sleep on the floor one night a week, maybe on a Friday, because that is uh, the day of Christ's crucifixion, or maybe on a Wednesday you are going to eat only once a day, because that is the day when Judah betrayed Christ, or maybe you are. I mean, there are all these all these creative ways in which you can give yourself to God, in which you can tell God that you love him, they, they, they build up a sense of intimacy with Christ like nothing else. And this hiddenness, when you take yourself down in the eyes of the world, when you purposely make a mistake, when you purposely say something stupid that you know is wrong, and then you argue for it as if it's, you know, you, you vouch your reputation on it, knowing very well what you're doing. Everybody knows it except you God and your spiritual father. And because of that secrecy, there's an intimacy that's being created between your heart and Christ. And, and out of that, wonderful things can happen. Thank you. I heard a little bell. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, these words are very, very, very challenging and inspiring and convicting all at once um, and uh, I, we've gone for about about an hour and so um, I do think it's probably best to start to wrap things up but I, I want to encourage everybody who is um, listens to our Mysterion podcast um, to um, explore um, a little bit more um, of uh, what Father Seraphim Aldea has to share online and uh, the Mole Monastery um, as well um, because that's been a resource, like I said, um, for me personally. Um, you know, I've made this journey in my life. I'm making this journey from theology as something in my, in my mind, some, as an understanding of God and an understanding of the scriptures, understanding of tradition, to, to beginning to understand it as uh, principally a place of the heart and a journey of the heart. And... Um, You've helped me along that journey, so I, I thank you for that. And I, that's one of the reasons why I want to encourage everybody. Um, uh, one of the big things that Mysterion tries to emphasize is that theology is, um, is, is fundamentally the desire for God. Um, and uh, if we can um, pursue that, um, I, think, I think one of the resources that many of us who maybe not have connection with the spiritual father or a personal connection with somebody who can walk with them, one of the places that they can go to um, um, is the things that you have to share. So thank you very much for that. Um, um, Ethan, I don't know if you have any other words to say before we close. No, just, just thank you, Father Seraphim. Uh, it's been an honor and a blessing to have you on here. And uh, we thank you for taking the time uh, to say some words to us about the tradition and the struggle of spiritual life. And, um, you know, as again, it's just an honor. It's the same here. I mean, I'm, I'm not just throwing words out there. It's been a joy. I've very, very much enjoyed meeting, really meeting, seeing and talking to you too. And anytime, anytime you want, just let me know. Genuinely. <laughs>